All right, so today's speaker is Arthur Apter, uh, uh, a regular attendee and also a presenter in our uh, set theory seminar and all uh, activities at the Graduate Center. And he's talking about the ultrafilter axiom and the number of normal measures over Aleph Omega plus one. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you, Gunter. So let me, let me begin with some preliminary material. And I'll start by uh, reviewing a few brief facts about the Mitchell ordering. Now, this has already been mentioned in a few of our previous lectures, but there are some things that are particularly relevant for what I'm going to be saying. And so let me just uh, mention those things now. Anyway, so uh, Mitchell, the Mitchell ordering is due to Bill Mitchell, and it was introduced in his 1974 uh, JSL paper, Sets Constructible from Sequences of Ultrafilter. So suppose we have a measurable cardinal kappa and u0 and u1 or normal measures over kappa. So u0 is Mitchell less than u1 if and only if u0 is in the ultra power by u1. u0 is a member of v to the kappa mod u1. And it's known that the Mitchell ordering is well founded and we also need to talk about what uh, the Mitchell order of the normal measure uh, u is, O of u, and that's just the rank of u in the Mitchell ordering. The Mitchell order of the measurable cardinal kappa, O of kappa, is just going to be the height of the Mitchell ordering, and if we have GCH, the maximal value of O of kappa is kappa double plus. So this is pretty familiar material, I think, to uh, most of us, but uh, the stuff about the ultra power axiom UA is, I think, slightly less familiar. So in particular, uh, if uh, I'm not that familiar with the ultra power axiom UA, so uh, Gabe, if I say, or anybody else, if I say uh, something that is just totally out of line and totally ridiculous, please correct me. Uh, I will apologize in advance. But anyway, the ultra power axiom uh, UA, which was introduced by Gabe Goldberg and Wooden, uh, has been extensively studied by Goldberg. And I mentioned his 2019 doctoral dissertation, which uh, Wooden supervised, his 2018 uh, JML paper, Journal of Math Logic paper, The Linearity of the Mitchell Order, and several additional papers which Gabe has submitted for publication. So here is what the ultra power axiom says. So we're gonna start with a model V of ZFC and U0, U1 in V are going to be countably complete ultra filters over these sets X0 and X1 in V and we have the associated elementary embeddings, JU0 from V to the ultra power MU0, the target model, and JU1 from V to the target model MU1. So then what do we have? So we have then that there must exist uh, ultra filters W0 in MU0, and it's an MU0 countably complete ultra filter. So it's an ultra filter in MU0 and with respect to MU0 over some set Y0 in MU0 and the same thing W1 in MU1 and MU1 countably complete ultra filter over some set Y1 in MU1 such that we have two things happening. So we have the embeddings generated by W0 and W1 from MU0 uh, into some model MW0 and MU1 into some model MW1. Well, MW0 and MW1 must be the same. Uh, the embeddings, the target of these embeddings has to be the same model M. But more than that, when we compose the embeddings, uh, JW0 and JU0 and JW1 and JU1, we get exactly the same thing. So it may be easier to take a look at a commutative diagram, which is going to illustrate 
the ultra power axiom. I think this might say a little bit more clearly exactly what's going on. So we have those countably additive ultra filters in U, uh, U0 in V and U1 in V. We have the embeddings generated into MU0 and MU1. And then we have the embeddings generated from MU0 uh, into the target model M and MU1 into the target model M. And these are the same. Again, as I said before, so we have first JU0 takes us from V to MU0, and then JW0 is going to take us from MU0 into something, but it, which I called MW0, but it's really going to be some fixed thing M, because JU1 is going to take us from V into MU1, and then JW1 is going to take us from MU1 into that same model M, and when we compose, we get the same embedding. So I think that perhaps this uh, commutative diagram may give a little bit of a clearer illustration of what's going on. So let me say a little bit something about the ultra power axiom. And again, uh, I am certainly no expert on this. So, uh, if I'm saying something here that is not quite correct, uh, I would appreciate uh, someone correcting me. But anyway, uh, so what I know, and this is uh, based on stuff that I've read about UA, is that it's known to be true in the usual inner models constructed at lower levels of the large cardinal hierarchy. But as Goldberg also stated in that 2018 JML paper that I referenced before, the ultra power axiom is also going to hold in inner models constructed by Wooden and Neiman Steel for finite levels of supercompactness. And these inner models were constructed using iteration hypotheses. So in particular, the ultra power axiom UA has therefore been studied in more generalized contexts, including models containing fully supercompact cardinals. So let me say again uh, that the ultra power axiom is this fairly new axiom, which uh, was introduced by Goldberg and Wooden, but it's known to be true in certain contexts, but not in all contexts that we might want to study. So in particular, it's not known at this point whether or not the ultra power axiom is going to hold in models containing fully super compact cardinals or even larger cardinals than that. But the evidence suggests that this is going to be the case. And so because of this, uh, the ultra power axiom has been studied in these more generalized contexts where we have models with these very large cardinals, super compactness and beyond. Now, Goldberg has shown that the ultra power axiom has really fantastic consequences. It has important, interesting, and beautiful consequences, what I would characterize. So one of these is go is what I'm calling the Kimchi Magidor property, because Kimchi and Magidor uh, established this. That is that it's uh, co relatively consistent with a class of supercompact cardinals that the supercompacts and strongly compacts coincide except at measurable limits. Now, you can have models of ZFC with supercompacts in which the supercompacts and the strongly compacts don't coincide uh, at all. Uh, they don't coincide uh, except, uh, well, they don't coincide. And of course, they uh, the least supercompact, uh, you can, well, the least supercompact and the least strongly compact may not be the same thing. Every supercompact can be a limit of strongly compact. I mean, you can have really that the supercompacts and strongly compact do not coincide and that the, co the coincidence would fail badly, but you can also have that they do coincide. And all of these are relative consistency results. However, if you have the ultra power axiom, if you have UA, you just straight out have this Kimchi Magidor property. 
that the super compact and strongly compact cardinals coincide, except at measurable limits. So it's an extremely powerful and very interesting consequence. And there are other consequences of the ultra power axiom that are really interesting. And for the purposes of what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be interested in Theorem 2.5 of Goldberg's 2018 JML paper, which tells us that the ultra power axiom implies that the Mitchell ordering over any measurable cardinal must be linear. So this is an extremely powerful uh, consequence. If you have the ultra power axiom, then the Mitchell ordering over any measurable cardinal, in fact, must be a linear ordering. So, uh, and as uh, uh, Goldberg noted in this paper, this means that the ultra power axiom implies that any super compact cardinal must carry only one normal measure concentrating on non-measurable cardinals. Now this fact about a super compact cardinal carrying only one normal measure, which concentrates on non-measurable cardinals, this is something that had been open for quite some time. I'm not sure who the first person was who asked whether or not uh, one could have a super compact with only one normal measure that concentrates on non-measurables. I think it was Solovey, uh, but uh, this question had been open for quite some time and the ultra power axiom just knocks it right out. If you have the ultra power axiom, uh, because you have the linearity of the Mitchell ordering, in particular, you're going to know that any super compact must carry only one normal measure, which concentrates on non-measurable cardinals. So I'm going to be interested in using this theorem, theorem 2.5 uh, from uh, Gabe's paper that the ultra power axiom implies that the Mitchell ring is linear because it's going to allow us to infer an easy proposition. And this is going to give us uh, really uh, the results that I'm going to be talking about. This is the key to the result. So here's- Sorry, sorry Arthur, can I just ask a quick question before you- Yeah, keep going? sure. Go ahead, Corey. Um, I, I just want to make sure I, I understood this correctly. So to say that the Mitchell order is linear, you mean on each measurable cardinal kappa, the, the Mitchell order on that cardinal is linear? Or is exactly. there some sort of global linearity? Yes, yes. I don't mean some global linearity. That's right. I mean, given a measurable cardinal, you look at all of the normal measures over that measurable cardinal, and they it's a linear ordering. It's a linear ordering, and I think I forgot to mention that the Mitchell ordering was well-founded, so that was on the earlier slide. And so the Mitchell ordering, in fact, is going to be a well ordering. But yes, I'm talking about over one particular measurable card, over each particular measurable cardinal, the Mitchell ordering is linear. That's right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. So here is this easy proposition. So where we're going to assume the ultra power axiom and we're going to have a measurable cardinal lambda of Mitchell order delta, and we're going to let delta gamma be the cardinality of delta. So if we have this, then the number of normal measures that lambda carries is going to be gamma. So if you have the ultra power axiom and you have a, and you have a measurable cardinal of some Mitchell order delta, the total number of normal measures has just got to be the cardinality of delta. And the, intu the intuitive proof is uh, very easy, as is the actual proof, basically because the Mitchell ordering is linear and therefore it's got to be a well ordering since it's well founded, just line everything up in a row. You can just, you just have a straight line of normal measures in the Mitchell ordering, a well-ordered straight line as a matter of fact. So look at its order type and then take uh, the cardinality of that and that gives you everything. So let me say that a little bit more formally. It's written in the proof here. 
So because you have UA, uh, as I just said, the Mitchell ordering over the particular measurable cardinal in question is linear, and it's got to be a well ordering since the Mitchell ordering is well founded. So let's let boldface U be the set of normal measures over this measurable lambda. So we can define a function f from delta to U by f of alpha equals the unique normal measure over lambda of Mitchell order alpha. And this is going to be well defined. Why? Well, you can't have two normal measures of the same Mitchell order because if you did, they have to be ordered, they have to be in a straight line. They have to be comparable one with the other. So they can't have the same Mitchell order. One has got to be above the order. One, of, one has got to be above the other, pardon me. So if we have this function f from delta, the order into the set of normal measures over lambda given by f of alpha is the unique normal measure over lambda of Mitchell order alpha, it's going to be well-defined and it's going to give a bijection between delta and u. So it's a dijection between delta and u. So the number of normal measures that lambda carries is the cardinality of delta, which is just gamma. So just line everything up by the ultra power axiom and you have a well ordering, look at its order type, take the cardinality, that's how many normal measures you have. Okay. So this is going to be uh, the linearity of the Mitchell ordering and proposition one, this easy consequence. These are going to be the only uh, consequences of the ultra power axiom that I'm going to be using. Now I'll turn my attention to the main topic of the lecture, which is going to be investigating the number of normal measures that are consistently possible at the successor of a singular cardinal. And I'm gonna focus in on the specific example of aleph omega plus one, although what I'm about to say is going to be applicable uh, in other contexts for other successors of singular cardinals, regardless of cofinality. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later on in this lecture. But what's known, uh, or what is one of the classical results that's known about the number of normal measures over aleph omega plus one when it's a measurable cardinal? And of course, we're talking about the axiom of choice failing. So what's known is that assuming AD plus DC, aleph omega plus one is a measurable cardinal and carries exactly three normal measures. And uh, the reason it only carries three normal measures, by the way, is because it satisfies the strong partition property. And there are only three regular cardinals below aleph omega plus one, assuming AD plus DC. These are going to be omega, aleph one, and aleph two. So the three normal measures are actually going to be those uh, generated by the omega club sets, the omega one club sets, and the omega two club sets. But anyway, uh, assuming AD plus DC, aleph omega plus one is measurable and carries exactly three normal measures. So we can just ask a general question, which is how many normal measures can aleph omega plus one carry when aleph omega plus one is a measurable cardinal? What about contexts other than AD plus DC? So let me tell you what I know about this. So an earlier theorem uh, said that starting from a model of ZFC containing cardinals kappa less than lambda, in which kappa is super compact, lambda is measurable, you can force and construct the choiceless inner model of ZF in which alpha omega plus one is measurable and carries exactly gamma normal measures where gamma greater than or equal to alpha omega plus two is an arbitrary regular cardinal and you don't need the ultra power axiom in the proof. So what I knew before this was that with sufficient super compactness assumptions, you could get alpha omega plus one to be measurable and carry uh, uh, any regular cardinal number of normal measures starting from alpha omega plus two and working your way upwards. Uh, and you could just do this with the standard super compactness assumptions. You don't need the ultra power axiom. 
but if you want to look uh, for numbers of normal measures less than or equal to alpha omega plus one and not equal to three, what's given by AD, you can use the ultra power axiom to construct models in which we have uh, any number of normal measures for gamma less than or equal to alpha omega plus one. So, as I've written here, uh, the ultra power axiom now allows us to construct uh, analogous models to the ones that were constructed earlier in which the number of normal measures gamma is less than or equal to alpha omega plus one. So here is what the theorem is, what I'm going to be discussing. So we're going to suppose we have a model of ZFC plus the ultra power axiom plus kappa less than lambda such that kappa is super compact, lambda is measurable, and O of lambda is delta for delta less than or equal to lambda double plus. So then you can force, there's a partial ordering P and V, a symmetric submodel of the generic extension by uh, P such that uh, this symmetric submodel N satisfies ZF plus alpha omega plus one is measurable and carries exactly gamma equals the cardinality of delta, not many normal measures. So if you have the ultra power axiom and the appropriate super compactness assumptions, kappa being super compact and lambda having some Mitchell order delta, you can just force and construct a, an inner model, uh, a choiceless inner model in which alpha omega plus one is measurable and carries the cardinality of delta many normal measures, whatever the cardinality of delta is going to be in N. So what are some examples? So as I say here, by the appropriate choice of delta, judicious choice of delta, you can assume that in N, depending on the order of uh, lambda, the Mitchell order of lambda that you start with, alpha omega plus one carries exactly one, two, 75, omega, alpha 57, alpha omega, alpha omega plus one, whatever you want, uh, normal measures any number less than or equal to alpha omega plus one, we can construct the model now assuming the uh, ultra power axiom and the appropriate super compact this assumptions. And also- Arthur, Arthur yes? could, I, could I just ask, um, this forcing is this uh, um, cardinal preserving or uh, do you it, know? No. no, it is, you are not going to, you're not going to preserve cardinals. You are absolutely going to be collapsing cardinals. Uh, but you can always start collapsing. If you're collapsing to alpha omega plus one, you can always start your collapse sufficiently high enough so that, for instance, if you want to be, there to be all of 57 many uh, normal measures, start collapsing uh, above all of 57. Start collapsing and alpha 58 or alpha 59 and start with a measurable lambda uh, such that O of lambda is alpha 57 in the ground model and then do the collapse that way. But you're definitely going not to be preserving cardinals. It's not a cardinal preserving okay. generic uh, extension. Uh, if you want there to be uh, alpha omega or alpha omega plus one, many normal measures, you'd have to start with O of lambda equals this super compact kappa because kappa is going to become alpha omega. Uh, if you want alpha omega, many normal measures. If you want alpha omega plus one, many normal measures, you have to start with O of lambda equals lambda because lambda is going to become alpha omega plus one. It's going to become kappa plus. So, okay. Okay. So uh, anyway, depending on the exact definition of, uh, of P, we can construct N so that we either have a complete failure of the axiom of choice or the maximal amount of the axiom of choice, which is consistent with alpha omega plus one being measurable, the DC alpha omega holds. So you can get models in which AC completely fails or you have the maximal amount of uh, the axiom of choice, DC alpha omega holding. And in addition, core model theory is going to tell us that strong hypotheses beyond the existence of the measurable, and that's going to turn out to be at least a wooden cardinal, have to be used in order to establish uh, this theorem. 
and I will come back to that in my later remarks. I will give you a sketch of the proof of how you're going to uh, be able to show that if you have a successor of a singular cardinal being measurable uh, that uh, and carrying normal measures, that you're going to have to have started with a ground model which contains at least a wooden cardinal. Anyway. Arthur, Arthur can, I, can I ask a question? Yes, sure, go ahead, Mia. Um, so when you're when you're counting your measures in this choiceless model do you mean so are you saying that the 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 set of measures on alpha omega plus one is bijective with this ordinal gamma or is it bijective with something that used to have used to have size delta in the ground model but may not be well orderable in no 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 i'm talking about a well-ordered cardinal Absolutely, I'm talking about a well-ordered cardinal because I'm starting from a, a ground model in which ZFC is true, we, the axiom of choice is true. So we always will have a cardinality here. The number of normal measures over lambda, over aleph omega plus one, is going to be a well-ordered cardinal, which comes from the ground model. Now, what it is may change. It's not uh, because, as I said, we're going to be, it's not a cardinal preserving uh, generic uh, extension or symmetric submodel. We're going to definitely be collapsing cardinals, but it's a well-ordered cardinal. All right. Thanks. Okay. Do you tell what's the in, in VP then? I, I'm sorry, can, I, I couldn't, I didn't get that, Corey. Could you please repeat the question? So before you go to the symmetric extension, you just look in VP and the generic extension. Did you kill the ultra power axiom when you did all this collapsing and all these other things? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the ultra power axiom has been killed. I mean, I don't know this. Uh, uh, well, the ultra, uh, I'm pretty sure that the ultra power axiom has been killed. Again, I don't know this for sure. Uh, I don't know, as a matter of fact, what kind of forcings, if any, beyond trivial forcing, are going to preserve the ultra power axiom. So uh, my guess is, and this is based on some discussions that James Cummings and I had, uh, we both seem to think that the ultra power axiom is fairly fragile. Probably if you even just add one Cohen wheel, you've killed it, but I don't know. Uh, that's actually a question that uh, that maybe Gabe knows. So, uh, uh, Gabe, do you know anything about this? If you add a Cohen reel, you preserve the ultra power axis. Oh, you do preserve it. Any, okay. But any forcing that's in D kappa, where kappa is the least uh, inaccessible, is going to preserve the ultra power axis. Oh, okay. But, okay. Do you know? Do you know what kills the ultra power axiom? Um, I mean, if you, if you kill the linearity of the Mitchell order. Yeah, of course. Um, you right, can if you kill any of the consequences, certainly you're going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not clear whether if you uh, collapse the first super compact cardinal uh, and there are large cardinals above, uh, do you preserve the ultra power axiom? So whether it's preserved by collapses is not obvious. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that answer. Uh, that uh, that was extremely useful and interesting. That uh, I have. Uh, there's new information here, stuff that I know. So thank you. Thanks. I think I'll can I push that question a little bit further. Um, even if the ultra power axiom gets killed, is there a chance that the Mitchell ordering survives? The linearity. Uh, I think the answer to that is actually yes. Uh, and so the way I can, the way I can answer that, uh, the way I can answer that question is uh, based on some work that Gittick has been doing. Gittick and his student, I think it's his, 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 this is his student, I.L. Kaplan. So they've been doing some really, really interesting work uh, 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 with the, uh, starting from the uh, linearity of the, uh, of the Mitchell ordering. And they've been constructing models in which the least strongly compact is the least measurable. This is uh, the Magidur identity crisis. But now this measurable is going to carry maybe 
one normal measure or two normal measures or 75 normal measures or what have you. So you don't have now, you do not have the consequence, Gabe's consequence, that uh, the super compacts and strongly compacts coincide except at measurable limits because the least strongly compact is the least measurable. So, uh, but, so let me, so wait a minute. So I don't think, wait a minute. I think that the answer I just gave is just total nonsense. Like, so uh, what I just said is nonsense actually, because uh, I don't think you would have the limit, necessarily have the linearity of the Mitchell, you won't have the linear. Well, I'm sorry. Let me, let me say that again. Let me say that again. It depends what the number of normal measures is. So if you just have one normal measure now over kappa, when the least strongly compact is the least measurable, then trivially you have the linearity of the Mitchell ordering. But if you started with a model of the ultra power axiom and uh, bigger measurables, larger cardinals above this initial super compact, because you're doing a small forcing here, you're not going to change the linearity of the, uh, of the Mitchell ordering at the larger measurable cardinals. The, the least measurable is the least strongly compact. It only has one normal measure. So you don't have the ultra power axiom holding because uh, you don't have uh, the super compact and strongly compact coinciding except at measurable limits, least strongly compact is the least measurable, but the Mitchell ordering is linear. So I think that's, that's an example, that gives you an, gives an answer to your question, Andreas. You can kill the ultra power axiom in this way and still have uh, the Mitchell ordering being linear. You can actually Thank just you. kill it from one measurable. Uh, if you do the friedman magador forcing uh, to preserve right. there's one normal measure, but add an unbounded subset of kappa, then you kill the ultra power axiom. So right. it, it's not known whether you, it's much harder to preserve it if you do non-trivial forcing there. It, anything that's not small forcing is pretty much unknown whether it preserves the ultra power axiom. So uh, it's not known whether it's consistent with UA uh, that GCH fails at the first measurable. Okay. Okay, so uh, are there any other questions or may I continue? Uh, just a small remark, Arthur. If I had to guess, I would say that you're going to use some uh, combination of Radin forcings to make lambda kappa plus and then collapse kappa to be alpha omega. Super compact trick reforcing actually. Yeah. So yep. if there are no uh, inaccessibles above lambda, then you get the ultra uh, power axiom trivially because there's just no more, you know, normal measures anywhere. Am I right? Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Do, do you mean in the choiceless inner model that I'm constructing? Well, no, in the full model, in VP. Uh-huh. Since there are no more measurable cardinals, then there are no more measures. So quite trivially, UA holds. Okay, yeah, I mean, you can, but I suppose you can, you can just do this. I mean, if you just have a limit on the number of measurables in the universe and you just kill, uh, you kill all the measurables, uh, you're going to, uh, trivially, the Mitchell ordering is going to be linear. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying yeah. otherwise, just as a small remark to the question before, whether or not UA holds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I will, uh, I will continue then. If there are other comments, please uh, interrupt, but uh, let, me, let me move on now. So let me talk about uh, how this theorem is going to be proved. So we're gonna let V be as in the hypotheses that I just mentioned, but I'm gonna do a little bit of a cheat here. I'm not going to talk really about collapsing to Aleph uh, Omega and Aleph Omega plus one, collapsing Kappa to Aleph Omega and Lambda to be Kappa plus to be Aleph Omega plus one. Uh, but I want to, because I would like to simplify the presentation and the simplified presentation with just the 
plain super compact uh, prick reinforcing contains all the relevant ideas. So what I'm going to do is uh, in the forcing conditions that I'm going to give, I'm going to create a final model N in which we're going to have DC kappa. Kappa is a singular cardinal having cof omega. Kappa plus equals lambda is measurable and carries exactly cardinality of delta many normal measures. But here is the remark about how you'd prove the uh, theorem, as I stated, the more complicated version. So if you want to prove uh, the more complicated version in which kappa is, uh, is singularized and collapsed to alpha omega and lambda is collapsed to alpha omega plus one kappa plus, you're either going to use a more complicated uh, version of the forcing conditions, which are due to Magidor, which will symmetrically collapse kappa to alpha omega and lambda to alpha omega plus one. If you want to have DC alpha omega to be true, or if you don't care about that, if it doesn't matter, uh, if you want to get, uh, uh, if you don't care about having any of the axiom of choice in your model, you can just build this uh, uh, symmetric model N that I'm about to discuss and force over it to collapse kappa to be alpha omega and lambda to be alpha omega plus one. Uh, in this way, you're going to have AC omega failing completely. And this follows a suggestion of Kanamori. Uh, when I was actually first thinking about this in the late 70s, I saw how to collapse, uh, how to change kappa's cofinality to be omega and collapse lambda to be kappa plus to get the successor of a singular cardinal to be measurable. Uh, but the question was bringing it down to alpha omega and Aki suggested this method just symmetrically collapse and you're going to bring everything down to alpha omega and alpha omega plus one. And then later on, when I wanted to get a uh, full axiom of choice, I started talking to uh, Menachem about it and he came up with these nice forcing conditions that actually work to get uh, DC alpha omega. Anyway, anyway. So let me tell you about the, uh, the forcing conditions without collapsing to uh, uh, alpha omega and alpha omega plus one. So to define these forcing conditions uh, P, which are going to be employed in the construction of this witnessing model N, I'm going to take some uh, normal measure U over P kappa lambda, which satisfies the Maynas partition property. And the Maynas partition property is just an analog for supercompactness of the partition property given by Robottom's theorem for normal measure over measurable cardinal given by Robottom's theorem. And then basically what we're going to do is define a supercompact analog of prickly forcing. So P is going to be defined as a set of all conditions of the form. Uh, we call it pi equals P1, P, and A, such that it's a finite stem, so N is finite, and PI, uh, each member of the stem, is going to be a member of P kappa lambda, uh, each of the finitely uh, member uh, of the stem. Uh, and then we have this strong containment. P1 is strongly contained in P2, is strongly contained in Pn, uh, and this strong containment uh, means that Pi is contained, uh, so Pi is strongly contained in Pj, means Pi is contained in Pj, and the order type of Pi is less than Pj intersect kappa, so that's what we have for the stem, and what about the measure one set? So A, of course, is the measure one set. It's in this normal measure U. And uh, for everything that is in the measure one set A, uh, the last member of the stem, Pn, is strongly contained in P. So this is basically the direct analog of what you have for ordinary Kirkby forcing. You have an increasing sequence of ordinals in the measure one set A, a uh, finite increasing sequence. We basically have the same thing here only we're talking about increasing, so to speak, with respect to strong containment, and we're working with P kappa lambda. And the ordering is basically also going to be analogous to what we have with prick reinforcing. Uh, so, uh, but first, let's just say that for any condition pi, uh, let's call P1 through Pn the P part of pi, 
Now the ordering is the usual analog uh, or the analog of what one would have with the usual form of prickly forcing. So we have that pi two, uh, which I'll call Q1, QMB, is going to extend pi one, which I'll call P1, PNA, if and only if. Well, we add more members to the sequence, so N is less than or equal to M. Uh, we keep the first N members the same. QI is PI for I equals uh, one through N. And then the remaining members, uh, Q, uh, QM plus one through QM, uh, are all going to come from that first measure one set A, are gonna come from A, so QI is in A, for I is N plus one through M, and B, of course, has gotta be a subset of A. So it's just the usual uh, prickery extension, uh, with, but we're doing it with respect to a supercompactus measure on P kappa lambda, as opposed to a normal measure on kappa, same thing. So now let's take a generic object over P and let's look at what the generic omega sequence is going to be. So I'm going to call R PI I less than omega. It's going to be the generic omega sequence generated by G. And what does this mean? Well, this means that anything that a PI is in R if and only if it's in the P part of some member of the generic object. So this is going to be our generic omega sequence, the collection of P parts for members of the generic set G. So what do we know in this full generic extension V of G? So we know uh, by, uh, well, we know by the, uh, by the Prickery lemma uh, using uh, the Maynard's partition property, uh, uh, Robottom's theorem, the analog of Robottom's theorem, whatever the, uh, the partition property, we know that kappa is going to remain a cardinal and have cofinality omega, but we also know by a density argument that the cofinality of gamma is going to be omega for all V regular cardinals gamma in uh, the closed interval kappa lambda. And by induction, all of the V cardinals gamma and the half an open interval kappa lambda, open at kappa closed and lambda, are going to be collapsed to kappa. So you have this generic omega sequence. And you can show by a density argument that all of the regular cardinals uh, strictly between kappa and lambda are going to uh, have their cofinalities change to omega. And uh, by induction, all of the V cardinals uh, are going to be collapsed. All of the V cardinals in the half an open interval kappa lambda uh, are going to be collapsed to kappa, open at kappa and closed at lambda. So uh, I once presented this actually many years ago. This was at a, uh, as was at a nest. So uh, I think Andreas, you're the, probably the only one who's in attendance here who knows what nests uh, was. This was a regional set. <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, this was a regional set theory seminar. But anyway, I uh, was once presenting something analogous to this, talking about this partial ordering, and I said that all regular cardinals had their cofinalities changed to omega and therefore were collapsed. And Cy Friedman was in the audience and he said, no, that's not what happened. So this is the correction that you have to do an induction to show that all the cardinals uh, between kappa and lambda, strictly greater than kappa and up to and including lambda are collapsed. Uh, you change the regular ones to their, their cofinalities to omega and then inductively everything else is collapsed. Anyway, anyway. So this is, of course, not going to be the choiceless inner model V of G because it's a model of the axiom of choice. Uh, it can't be our model. It's a model of the axiom of choice. And lambda has been collapsed uh, to have cardinality kappa. So it's not going to be the desired inner model N, which will witness the conclusions of the theorem. So what is N going to be? So roughly speaking, N is going to be the least model of ZF, which extends V, which contains the chop-offs of the generic sequence. What I mean by the chop-offs of the generic sequence is we just restrict the generic sequence R to gamma by intersecting with 
gamma for all of the inaccessible cardinals uh, in the half an open interval kappa lambda. This time we include kappa, but don't include lambda because we want to preserve the fact that lambda is going to be immeasurable. So to be a little bit more formal, although that, that much more formal, to define n, so for any gamma in this half open interval kappa lambda, closed at kappa, open at lambda, and inaccessible in V, look at R restricted to gamma, which is the set of pi intersect gamma for i and, uh, and omega, and what we know is that in V of R restricted to gamma, we're going to collapse all of the V cardinals in the half open interval kappa gamma, uh, open at kappa, closed at gamma. They're going to be collapsed to kappa. All the V regular cardinals uh, in the closed interval kappa gamma, uh, well, the regular cardinals are going to be collapsed, uh, are going to have cof omega. And all the V cardinals, as I just said, are going to be collapsed to kappa with the V regulars having cofinality omega. And so now the intuitive dis uh, description of N is the least model of ZF extending V, which contains for each V inaccessible cardinal gamma in this half an open interval kappa lambda, the set R restricted to gamma. So just look at all of the inaccessibles uh, in the half open interval kappa lambda, don't include lambda, look at the chop offs to gamma of R, uh, pi intersect gamma for each member of R, and just take the least model of ZF, which extends V and contains all of those, uh, all of those R restricted to gamma, all of those chop offs. Anyway, so here is what we know, and I'm not going to uh, get into the uh, proof of this first part, that N satisfies ZF plus DC kappa, plus kappa is a cardinal having cof omega, plus lambda equals kappa plus is measurable and carries normal measures. So what I've done in this choiceless model N that I constructed is it's a model of ZF, I'm going to have DC kappa, and in fact, the uh, fact that DC kappa holds in this is uh, due to George Kafkoulis. I believe that's the main theorem in this thesis. I've singularized kappa, I've changed its cofinality to omega, and I've collapsed lambda to be kappa plus, but I've preserved that it's measurable, and I've also preserved that it carries normal measures. So this is what we have. So now we just have to count the number of normal measures over lambda equals kappa plus in N. And again, this is basically a consequence of theorem 2.5 of, of Gabe's paper and the easy proposition one. It's an easy consequence of that combined with the fact that the normal measures over lambda in N are all generated in the lady solivay by the normal measures over lambda in V. So we know that, so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the original order delta uh, and uh, between the original order delta and the normal measures over lambda in N, because they're basically the same as the normal measures over lambda in V. So the number of normal measures is just going to be the cardinality of lambda or gamma in N. So to be a little bit more formal, uh, what I've written here is uh, every normal measure mu star over lambda in N, there exists a normal measure mu over lambda in V, such that mu star is a set of x contained in lambda, there exists y in mu, such that y is contained in x. So every normal measure mu star over lambda in N must extend in the levy solove way one normal measure over lambda in V. And uh, in fact, the fact that this, uh, that a symmetric intermodel constructed this way, that this is where the normal measures come from, this is actually something that was essentially shown by, uh, by Bull and Kleinberg in their 1979 transaction AMS uh, paper. Uh, 
a consistent consequence of AD. So that's just a historical note. But anyway, uh, because this is the way the normal measures are generated, there's got to be one-to-one -one correspondence, which you can define in N between the normal measures over lambda and V and the normal measures over lambda in N. But again, we have uh, UA holding and we have proposition one and theorem two five from Gabe's, from Gabe's paper. We know that lambda carries precisely the cardinality of delta normal measures in V. So this one-to-one -one correspondence we have in N set tells us that N satisfies that lambda carries precisely cardinality of delta many normal measures. And that's the discussion of the proof of theorem one. So again, in a nutshell, when we do this collapse, we have all of the properties we want, except for the number of normal measures. Uh, and how do we get this number of normal measures? By this uh, correspondence between the normal measures in N and the normal measures in V in the simplest possible way. And the number of normal measures we have over lambda in V given to us by UA uh, and Gabe's theorem 2.5 and, the, uh, uh, and this easy consequence proposition one. Anyway, so that's the proof. So I have a bunch of remarks to make. So let me make these remarks now uh, for in total, I believe. So I had mentioned earlier that strong hypotheses beyond the existence of one measurable cardinal are required to construct models in which the successor of a singular is measurable and carries normal measures. So you've got to start with something strong, something beyond one measurable. And here's a sketch of the proof of why this would be. So suppose kappa is singular and kappa plus is measurable and carries a normal measure. Let's take one of those normal measures and do prick reforcing using that normal measure. And in fact, you can do prick reforcing even without the axiom of choice uh, because you can canonically prove Robottom's theorem and then just do prick reforcing in the usual way. So you will have changed kappa plus's cofinality to omega and not added any bounded subsets of kappa plus. So in particular, kappa is still a singular cardinal. So now we have two singulars in a row. Kappa and kappa plus are both singular. But we can refer to a theorem due to uh, Schindler. So uh, this is in his 99 JSL paper, Successive uh, Weakly Compact or Singular Cardinals. I think that's the name of it. And what Ralph shows in this paper is that if you have two uh, singulars or two weakly compacts in a row, then you've got to have an inner model containing a wooden. So we have the two singulars in a row. So by, uh, by Schindler's theorem, uh, there's got to be an inner model containing a wooden cardinal. So you can't just start with a, uh, you can't just start with a measurable here and get a model in which uh, you have the successor of a singular being uh, measurable. Uh, you have to start with something stronger by this uh, argument that I've outlined. So that's the first remark. And the second remark, picking up on what I said, uh, on what I said earlier, uh, so the methods that I've outlined, there's nothing uh, that's special about Aleph Omega plus one. So the methods that I outlined are applicable to the successors of other singulars. So Aleph Omega plus one can be uh, the successor of, N, of other uh, singular cardinals of Kof Omega. Pick your favorite one. I have some examples here. Aleph Omega plus Omega plus one. Aleph Omega squared plus one. Aleph sub Aleph Omega squared plus one. Whatever you want, uh, just, just uh, describe or define the forcing conditions, the symmetric collapse in the uh, appropriate way. And if you do a, uh, and you don't have to restrict your uh, attention to successors of singular cardinals of countable 
co-finality. So this is getting back to Asaf's earlier comment about using some kind of rate enforcing. So you can use some version of supercompact rate enforcing together with the ultra power axiom if you want to get analogous results for Aleph Omega 1 plus 1 or other successors or singulars of uncountable cofinality. And if you want a large number of uh, normal measures, you don't even need to use the ultra power axiom. Uh, I should say here that the ultra power axiom is being used to restrict the number of normal measures. If you don't have the ultra power axiom, you can get large numbers, precise numbers of large numbers of normal measures. The ultra power axiom restricts the number of normal measures that you can get. So it's also possible to get global results. Uh, so you can get global results that can, can be obtained from uh, UA together with suitable additional hypotheses. So suitable super compact this uh, assumptions. So for instance, uh, what's an example? You can get a uh, model, you can construct a model of ZF in which uh, the axiom of choice fails completely, AC omega is false, every successor cardinal is regular, every limit cardinal is singular, and the successor of every singular cardinal is measurable and carries, let's say, one normal measure or two normal measures or 75 normal measures, what have you. You can get the appropriate global results from UA, or if you want a large number, you don't need UA, and the appropriate super compactness hypotheses. But now let me say something about successors of regulars. So successors of singulars, if we want to talk about controlling the number of normal measures, we need to use strong hypotheses. Uh, we need to use, uh, well, we need to use at least a wooden cardinal and we may need to use the ultra power axiom. Uh, but uh, if we're just talking about successors of regulars, none of this is necessary. You don't need the ultra power axiom and you don't need more than one measurable cardinal. So what's an example? So suppose you want to construct a model in which Aleph 1 is measurable and carries two normal measures. So what do you do? So you're going to, you're going to take your uh, original measurable kappa, you're going to go into L mu, and then do Friedman Magidur. <coughs> Gabe mentioned uh, Friedman Magidur a little earlier. Do Friedman Magidur over L mu and get two normal measures, then symmetrically collapse the measurable to be Aleph 1. So if you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about successors of regulars, you don't need fancy hypotheses. You don't need strong hypotheses. You just need one measurable cardinal, and then you can do, uh, you can uh, control the number of normal measures over the successor, over this measurable when it's a successor of a regular. You can control these uh, in a fairly standard way uh, using, by just going into the standard model L mu, and then doing Friedman Magidor. If you want a large number of normal measures, just blow up the number of normal measures in a standard way. Uh, like Kuhn in Paris, for instance, whatever. And uh, once again, nothing is going to be special. I just picked uh, Aleph 1 here. You can uh, use basically the same proof to create, starting from one measurable, a model in which whatever, I'm saying Aleph Omega 5 plus 8 is measurable and carries exactly Aleph 36 many normal measures or whatever you want, you know, just pick your favorite crazy numbers and just do it. Uh, you can do it in an, uh, you can do it in an easy, uh, in an easy way, just from one measurable, uh, just from one measurable, uh, you don't need uh, additional assumptions. Although I guess I could make an additional comment here, which is that 
prior to Friedman Magidor, prior to that, and that paper only appeared in the JSL in 2009, and I guess they were doing their work uh, in the mid uh, in the mid 2000s. Prior to uh, Friedman Magidor, if you wanted to prove a theorem like what I've mentioned uh, over here or alluded to in uh, this remark number four, what you would have had to have done would be start with a cardinal of appropriate Mitchell rank, some big Mitchell rank, but beyond one measurable, gone into one of Mitchell's canonical inner models uh, constructed from coherent sequences of uh, measures where you have a precise number of normal measures and then done the collapse. So it's only with the advent of Friedman Magidor fairly recently that we can actually uh, get that we only need one measurable uh, to control the number of normal measures either over the measurable in an AC situation or over the uh, measurable, the, suc the successor of the regular when it's measurable in the non-AC situation. So friedman Magidur is actually quite important here for just one measurable. Anyway, so for each of the results that I described in the theorem two and three and uh, previous remarks two and three, the ultra power axiom is key to the proof and also if the number of normal measures uh, gamma at the successor of the singular kappa is going to be such that one is less than or equal to gamma is less than or equal to kappa plus, uh, the proofs are going to require that the measurable lambda collapse to kappa plus be such that O of lambda equals delta for the appropriate delta. So even though I'm able, or even though one is able to remove the assumption of a Mitchell uh, cardinal of high order, if we're just looking at the successor of a regular cardinal, the successor of a singular at this point, at this point, if you want to restrict the number of normal measures, uh, at least with the methods I know, you seem to need UA. So this leads to some questions. So one, can ultra power axiom UA be removed as a hypothesis? And also the second question that I have is the, can the requirement that uh, Mitchell order uh, delta for lambda be removed and somehow be replaced by a friedman magidor style argument to control the number of normal measures lambda carries? So can you somehow uh, get rid of ultra power axiom and also this assumption of a, of a measurable of appropriate Mitchell order? And I'm going to conjecture that failing the existence of inner models for uh, super compactness hypotheses that also satisfy uh, fine structural properties, whatever they might be, the answer to both of these questions is no. Now we may be chasing our tail here. So the property we need, of course, the key property is the linearity of the Mitchell ordering, which is probably much weaker than the ultra power axiom. So, but it may also be the case that if you get these magical inner models for super compactness existing, uh, I don't know what Wooden thinks his ultimate L is going to look like. Probably you're gonna have the ultra power axiom there anywhere, anyway, and so you uh, just have this. Uh, but maybe, so you can do this collapse of the measurable of high Mitchell order, but maybe in ultimate L, whatever it looks like, uh, maybe you have some kind of uh, fine structural property so that you uh, can do some weird analog of friedman magidor and you don't have to collapse a, Mitchell or, uh, a measurable of high Mitchell order to restrict the number of normal measures. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Thanks. Um, thank you, Arthur, um, for that interesting talk. So let's see, um, are there any more questions? A lot of questions were asked already during the talk, but uh, yeah. this would be the time to ask so further about questions. The, the second question at the end. Yeah. Um, so there's the work of Marty Gittig and his student, Elon Belinsky. Uh, where they create a model where there's a measurable with no normal measures. Yes, yes, I'm aware of that and I didn't discuss that. So if you want to ask me about that, I do have some remarks about that. 
No, so, so I think that the method could be perhaps refined to control the number of normal measures. And then you can start with a friedman Magidor argument and just kill some of the measures, you know, in the style of belinsky gitik and end up with, you know, this small number of measures. Okay. For, I don't see how that would be possible for the successor of a, for the successor of a singular, uh, though. Uh, I, I think I understand what you're saying, Asaf, if you're talking about the successor of a, uh, well, okay. Um, well, actually, I guess I guess I'm still uh, I guess I'm a little confused. I don't see I don't see how this would work for the uh, for the successor of a uh, of a singular because you I mean at least the proofs that I know you need some kind of uh, you need some kind of super compactness hypotheses and uh, you don't necessarily have ultra power axiom or fine structure or whatever. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I mean, I think that's a nice. I think that's a nice idea. But actually, since you bring up uh, the Belinsky gitik construction, I do have some. I do actually have uh, some comments about that that I can make. I didn't know whether or not I was going to make them, but uh, uh, you have raised that. You have raised that construction. So uh, let me make my comments. Uh, so uh, what uh, Asaf is alluding to is this construction by. Uh, Belinsky and Gittick, where they take a uh, just a measurable cardinal and they force and construct a symmetric inner model in which uh, the, uh, in which the measurable cardinal kappa carries no normal measures whatsoever. So DC is going to fail. There are exact. There are zero normal measures that you can that you carry. So, uh, and they're just using one measurable cardinal. Now, this is a very old question, actually, whether or not it's possible to get a measurable cardinal with zero normal measures. So, uh, it goes back to uh, at least my days in graduate school in the mid 1970s when the Kleinberg set theory group was talking about this. So I certainly remember this question. I entered graduate school 45 years ago, 1975, and I'm pretty sure I remember this question being discussed then. Uh, so there was an early result due to uh, Mitchell Spector, uh, and it's in his thesis, where he uh, uses AD and he constructs a model uh, with a measurable cardinal uh, without a well-founded ultra power. So there's a normal measure that cannot be, uh, or there is a measure, I should say, in the generic extension, which cannot be normalized. There's not some rudin keesler minimal measure uh, or that you can use for your normal measure. Uh, and he constructed this, I'm saying using AD, actually it was the appropriate partition property. But as I said, uh, or as Asaf mentioned, uh, Belinsky and Gittick did this uh, with just a measurable and they have a model in which there is a measurable with no normal measures, uh, with no normal measures, uh, just using a measurable cardinal. Now the model that Belinsky and Gittick construct, their measurable is still a limit cardinal. So you can wonder whether or not you can bring this down. You can bring, uh, you can bring this down to be, the, to be a successor cardinal. So can you get a model in which a successor cardinal is measurable and carries zero normal measures? So once again, if it's the successor of a regular cardinal, the answer is yes. So let me tell you how this would be done. Uh, Gittick and Belinsky don't address this in their paper, but I can tell you how this could be done. This is something that I've been thinking about over the last week. You just look at their construction and you construct, uh, well, okay, if you just do, let's, let's not get fancy for the, for, uh, for the beginning. Let's suppose that you just want this 
for Aleph 1, Aleph 1 to be measurable and have zero normal measures. So what you can do is you can just do the gittik Belinsky uh, construction as they've done it, and then symmetrically collapse uh, kappa to that uh, limit card to be omega 1 using uh, collapse omega less than kappa. Now, why is this going to work? Because this is a well-ordered partial ordering, an absolute well-ordered partial ordering. So you can basically say uh, where the normal measures are coming from, not where, where any of the measures are coming from, where any of the measures in the final uh, generic, uh, uh, symmetric generic extension are coming from, they're going to come from this uh, choiceless uh, ground model that we're forcing over uh, in which there are no normal measures. And we have here that col omega less than kappa is, uh, is canonically well orderable. So there's, no, so there's no problem there. So we can apply the Bull-Kleinberg analysis. But what if you want it not to be Aleph 1? What if you want it to be Aleph 2 or Aleph 3 or what have you? Well, what you need to do, I think, is just construct this, just do the uh, gittik Belinsky construction with a slight modification, not working with all of the inaccessibles or malos or whatever they start with below your original measurable kappa, but just on a tail of these beyond a certain point, and you're still going to get that normal, uh, you're still going to get that model with no normal measures. But what you have is that uh, you are not going to be adding certain, uh, you're not going to be adding uh, certain bounded sequences. So, uh, you know, wherever that least inaccessible or whatever it is that you start from, you don't add any, so call that, let's say, delta, you don't add any less than delta sequences. But now if you wanted to look at, let's say, collapse, uh, uh, collapse from uh, kappa down to be, let's say, olive 2, call olive 1 uh, less than kappa, you have the same partial ordering because you haven't added bounded sequences. And its chop-offs, its restrictions are also going to be well orderable when you force over this, uh, when you force over this uh, uh, this model that's constructed uh, in the gittik Belinsky way, where, uh, where you have no, uh, nothing uh, of the axiom of choice, at least not DC, um, and uh, you have no normal measures. Maybe you have no normal measures, but you still have col uh, omega 1 less than kappa, let's say, uh, kappa is that big measurable, is well orderable. Its chop offs are going to be well orderable. So you can just do the same analysis. So it seems to me that the successor of a regular cardinal carrying zero normal measures is something that you can probably, is something that can be done. But now what about the successor of a singular cardinal carrying no normal measures? I actually, I don't see at the moment any way of doing that using the techniques that I know about because you need some kind of super compact trick reforcing and where is the normal measure that generates the super compact trick reforcing going to come from, even if you start with kappa being an indestructible super compact and you do the four and you do the gittik Belinsky forcing, the normal measure that you might uh, get in the full generic extension, uh, you can't necessarily use that, it seems to me, to do the uh, symmetric collapse because it seems to me uh, that that full normal measure uh, may have too much information that's just going to wreck the fact that this cardinal you're collapsing is measurable or even a cardinal. Uh, I just think there's too much information there. And I don't really see any ways of restricting this normal measure. So, uh, so that seems to me to be a very interesting and challenging question, trying to get the successor of a singular to be measurable and carry zero normal 
measures. Uh, that to me seems to be interesting and uh, challenging uh, and somewhat difficult, whereas for the successor of a, that's a successor of a singular, successor of a regular, I think you can just do it. Anyway, so I was blathering on for, I don't know, four or five minutes there, but uh, since, uh, since the gittik polinsky uh, construction came up, I figured I'd make these remarks. Anyway, any other okay. questions? Thank you. Yeah, I was about to ask that. Are there any further questions? Um, Arthur, I have a question. So you said that what you're really using is the linearity uh, of the Mitchell order part uh, of UA uh, implications. So we don't have any other natural models where, where uh, the Mitchell order is linear other than UA models? Well, the only models that I know of are at the lower levels of the large, or at the lower level of the large cardinal hierarchy. You know, if you look at inner models for Strong's or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, but there's nothing that I know of for, uh, uh, for the hypotheses that I've been using here for strong compactness, super compactness, whatever, that you get models in which, the midi in which the Mitchell ordering is linear without using the ultra power axiom. I don't know of anything. That's open. Uh, probably, I mean, you can have a model that satisfies the ultra power axiom, that doesn't satisfy the ultra power axiom, but has the Mitchell order linear. Uh, but it, it always comes from forcing over a fine structure model and it's not known how to get the, yeah. linear, the Mitchell order without that. Yeah, that's what I was just, just thinking, that it seems that if you want to do it, you just force over the, okay, yeah. And those are not the ones you want. Right. Um, Gabe, so I have a question for you, maybe, since you're here. So you have in the ultra power axiom, uh, it starts with embeddings on V. Uh, can you have it with embeddings on arbitrary inner models? So uh, instead of V, you have some inner model M? Uh, you mean assert that for all inner models or? Yeah. yeah? Yes. Well, if you have large enough cardinals, you're, you have to have inner models uh, for which the ultra power axiom is going to be false because uh, I, I mean I guess it depends on how you want to state it but uh, you'll be able to you know produce an inner model that that doesn't have uh, the Mitchell order linear just you know uh, like in your paper with Joel all the forcing extensions you can get with larger cardinals as inner models. I guess there would be possible variations to the question, like the ultra filters that you apply to the inner model may be external or to the inner model, I mean, uh, or I don't know right. if that makes sense. Um, so the, the, if you only demand that, if you have two internal ultra filters, you can always compare by with one of them internal and one of them external. It's just, uh, you, mm -hmm. so that's always possible. It's just provable. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, and then comparing external ultra filters, I don't know, uh, but, but you sort of wouldn't expect that every inner model would be well behaved. Mm -hmm. That's possible. I had a, a question. Um, do you know if Aleph Omega plus one can have uh, Mitchell rank uh, greater than three? Uh, okay. Well, okay. I'm, well, you know, when you are you talking about the you mean the, the linear with the linearity of the Mitchell ordering? I'm, I mean, I'm not sure I understand because we're talking about models in which AC is false. Yeah, but you can define the Mitchell order combinatorially. Um, so in, in the AD context, uh, the omega club measure will be below the omega one club measure, below yeah. the omega two club measure. Uh, so it, it, it's just like you take the definition of the Mitchell order and you get rid of Wash's theorem. 
uh, and that gives you um, ZF Mitchell order. Um, yeah, but it seems like your models will all have Mitchell order zero. I think that's probably correct. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question. Okay. Are there any further questions? Just a clarification from Gabe uh, and maybe Alto as well. So what you want is actually to have, let's say, all the Aleph ends measurable, you know, with the club uh, filter measurable, you know, up to a, a choice of cofinality or something like this, and also Aleph Omega plus one, and then you'd have, you know, this nice ranking of measures. That's what you meant. Well, uh, I guess uh, you wouldn't have to have all the Aleph ends necessarily measurable. But... True, but let's say also Aleph 3 is measurable with, right. you know, three measures corresponding to the regulars below it, and then Aleph Omega plus 1 with four measures. So that's the... Yeah, something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. That's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's not known. Uh, I mean, one can, uh, AD gives you three measurables in a row, but if you want uh, four measurables in a row, nobody, uh, nobody knows about that. If you get that in, uh, from AD and L of R, um, and in fact, uh, nobody even knows whether or not you can have all of two, all of three, and all of four uh, measurable, or at least when I say nobody, to the best of my knowledge. Now, if somebody here is going to say, yes, I know the answer to that question, I'd be absolutely thrilled. But to, uh, to the best of my knowledge, so let me qualify, to the best of my knowledge, nobody knows about four measurables in a row in L of R assuming AD, and you do get three measurables in a row uh, from AD. That, that was originally proven by Kekris in the mid 80s. Uh, but if you want, for instance, all of two, all of three, and all of four, all measurable. You can get all of one, all of two, and all of three all measurable. That's, uh, that's fairly easy to do. But if you want all of two, all of three, and all of four measurable from any hypotheses, uh, I don't know any way of doing that. I don't know that anyone does know any way of doing that. And if somebody uh, attending this lecture knows a way of doing it, please, I would like to know. That would be a phenomenal theorem as far as I'm concerned. Okay, any more questions or comments? All right, well then, then let's, let's thank Arthur again for this very interesting talk. All right, um, so thank you. I'm gonna stop recording. I think... Um,